Facing the council wasn't the daunting part. It was when the council turned their faces away that things became truly terrifying. Dr. Moto pleaded as he watched, his heart sinking as one by one, the members of the O5 Council literally turned their backs to him. Standing beneath the almost blinding spotlight overhead, he tried to look around the dimly lit chamber, searching for a way out, some kind of emergency exit he could rush toward, though he knew there was no hope of making it in time. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw movement. It was just enough to catch his attention. Vines or tentacles splayed out and reached for him from behind. The reddish-brown tint, caused by rust and blood, told him the sculpture was behind him. It had stopped for now. Seeing it in his peripheral vision was enough to hold it still. A quantum lock, one of the Foundation doctors had called it, the ultimate defense mechanism. Dr. Moto had once believed this too, but now he wasn't so sure. This wasn't part of the anomaly's defense. It was a trap. It was left unobserved so often, almost constantly, except during periodic cleanings. In those moments when nobody was looking, the sculpture was free to move. Personnel had heard scraping sounds when no one was inside the containment room. It hadn't just been free to move, it had been free to plot, to change. Now Moto was stuck, unable to look away from the anomaly, aware that as soon as he did, his life would end. The council would keep their backs turned until Dr. Moto's body fell, lifeless, his neck broken. Slowly, Moto turned to face the anomaly, his gaze trailing up the winding rebar appendages, which would seize his throat the moment his aching eyes blinked. Its body, a large chunk of concrete vaguely shaped like a torso, gave way to a head with a spray-painted face above an open midsection of twisted rebar below. The rebar looked like intestines, as if the sculpture's guts were spilling out, aided by the red tint of dried blood. More rebar appendages protruded like legs from the lower part of the concrete. This wasn't the SCP-173 he remembered. It had changed. It used to look more like a statue, deliberately shaped by an anomalous artist. But nobody else remembered the old SCP-173. Everyone had called Dr. Moto insane for claiming that this new anomaly bore little resemblance to the sculpture he knew, and his word should have carried more authority on the matter. After all, he was the one who had first discovered SCP-173 all those years ago. The new SCP-173's lifeless concrete face was inches away. Even though it only had two hollow spaces on its spray-painted face that resembled eyes, it felt like the sculpture was glaring at him, accusingly. Dr. Moto's eyes began to water, urging him to blink, but he forced himself to keep looking. Don't blink, he thought if he could hold on just a little longer. Several hours later, alarms blared as blood-red lights flashed through the hallways of SCP Foundation Site-19. Inside SCP-173's containment chamber, three personnel lay dead on the floor, one still clutching a mop in their cold, stiff fingers. It had been a routine bi-weekly cleaning. It should have been mundane. But the two members of personnel assigned to observe SCP-173 had blinked, thinking they were safe. With the third person's back turned, SCP-173 had moved, snapping all of their necks. None of them had seen what killed them. Immediately, Class IV hazardous object containment procedures were put into effect. Security teams rounded up groups of D-Class personnel, two to observe, one to place a cage around SCP-173. Once secured, they used a forklift or any other means to move the sculpture back to its cell. But there was just one problem. In the split second SCP-173 had been unobserved after breaking out of its cell, it had vanished. Nobody had thought to watch the outside of its containment chamber during cleaning. After all, the procedure was routine. But this time, the sculpture had used the opportunity to flee Site-19 altogether. Dr. Moto received the call moments later and was rushed to Site-19. His expertise with SCP-173 was unmatched as he had been the one to discover the anomalous statue back in 2007 aboard a decommissioned U.S. Navy aircraft carrier. The Foundation hoped that consulting Moto would help track down the missing anomaly, but the moment he was shown security footage, he knew something was wrong. The Foundation had slowed down footage from Site-19's internal surveillance, 
scanning frame by frame until they found grainy stills of SCP-173 escaping the facility. But something was off. This was not the sculpture Dr. Moto had discovered. The Foundation personnel around him exchanged concerned glances. The image on screen was blurry, catching the sculpture in motion, but they all recognized it as SCP-173. Dr. Moto, though, insisted that the anomaly was bipedal, walking on two legs instead of multiple twisted rebar poles seen on this one. Its concrete skin had been a pale yellow, with traces of Krylon brand spray paint making up its crude facial features, with a bigger, more rotunded head. Nervously, researchers looked with uncertainty at the senior Foundation doctor. Not one of them had heard of the anomaly he was describing. Dr. Moto stormed out, frustrated and confused. Why did nobody else remember what SCP-173 looked like? Where had this new version of what was seemingly the same anomaly suddenly appeared from? As his mind raced, his cell phone rang. He didn't recognize the number, but he answered out of habit. On the other end was a voice he hadn't heard in years, one that he had all but forgotten. When SCP-173 was first discovered, the boat it had been hiding on was taken to a Foundation-owned salvage yard. Moto had asked a security guard, Jim, to contact him if there was ever any unusual activity aboard the decommissioned aircraft carrier. Now, all these years later, something was happening on the wreck of the USS Walrus, and Jim had kept his word. As Dr. Moto raced to the salvage yard, something heavy was crashing through the USS Walrus. Nobody had set foot aboard the Walrus since 2007, or rather, nobody human had. Although it didn't remember how, SCP-173, the original version, had somehow appeared there some time ago, as if its decades spent locked up by the SCP Foundation had been little more than a bad dream. Now it was back in the closest thing to a home it had ever known, and free to move around unobserved. For a time, the old SCP-173 had been peacefully living in the belly of the USS Walrus, completely unaware that back in its containment chamber at the Foundation, another anomaly, identical in every way save for its appearance, had taken its place. Until that anomaly came bursting through the walls of the abandoned shipwreck. Rebar tendrils tore through the ship's weakened metal hull as the new SCP-173 forced its way inside. It moved swiftly, unobserved, driven by a singular instinctive purpose to find and destroy the other. Its rusted limbs snaked around pipes, and its senses honed in on the presence of its older counterpart aboard the ship. The sound of tearing metal echoed like an enraged animal's cry as the new SCP-173 ripped through walls, decimating everything in its path. Inside the bowels of the USS Walrus, the original SCP-173 sensed the intrusion. It had been living in the wreckage unbothered for years, but now something fearsome and unfamiliar had entered its home. The new version of SCP-173, while physically similar, radiated a hostility that the old sculpture could almost feel. The new version of the sculpture snarled, or would have if it had a mouth. Much like its predecessor, the anomaly had no face beyond a crudely painted facsimile of one, but that also meant that neither of them had eyes. The two anomalies now faced each other in the dim light of the ship's abandoned corridors. The new SCP-173 moved first charging at the original, its rebar limbs lashing out at blinding speeds. The older version reacted instinctively, dodging just in time. Despite being unobserved, both anomalies could move at incredible speeds. So fast, in fact, that any human observer would barely be able to track their motions. But here, in the ship's isolated corridors, they were free to battle at full force. The new SCP-173 was faster, stronger, and more aggressive, its rebar tendrils wrapping around the neck of the older sculpture. The original struggled as cracks formed in its concrete body under the pressure, but it fought back with a desperate kick, knocking one of the new sculpture's rebar legs out from under it. The new version toppled forward, momentarily loosening its grip. The old SCP-173 seized the opportunity to break free, darting down the narrow corridor trying to put as much distance as possible between itself and its relentless pursuer. The old SCP-173 knew it couldn't win this fight, not with sheer force, 
The new version was simply too powerful. Its only option was to escape, to find a way off the ship, or at least hide long enough to avoid destruction. But with every move it made, the new SCP-173 was right behind, tearing through the walls and corridors in its furious pursuit. Outside, Dr. Moto reached the salvage yard, rushing past the small security office and following Jim's directions to the wreck of the USS Walrus. The sounds of metal crashing and heavy stone scraping against the ship's interior were unmistakable. Something was happening inside, and it wasn't good. Moto's heart raced as he approached the ship. Suddenly, he stopped, his eyes widening in shock. A massive dent had appeared in the ship's outer hull, as if something or someone inside was smashing its way through. Inside the ship, the new SCP-173 had caught up to the original. With a powerful swing, it slammed the older sculpture against the wall, leaving a deep impression in the metal. The new version was stronger, more aggressive, and had a clear advantage. The original SCP-173 tried to fight back, but it knew it couldn't match the new version's sheer force. As the new sculpture's rebar limbs wrapped around its body, lifting it off the ground, the old SCP-173 realized it had no way to escape. There was only one way this could end. The new SCP-173 prepared to deliver the final blow. It hoisted the original high above its head, ready to slam down and shatter the older sculpture into pieces. If it had a mouth, it would have roared in triumph. But just as it was about to strike, both anomalies froze. They were being watched. A mobile task force had arrived, storming into the wreckage of the walrus just in time. Their weapons raised, laser sights trained on both sculptures. The presence of observers instantly triggered SCP-173's quantum lock, freezing both versions in place. The old sculpture was suspended in midair, held above the head of the new version, inches away from being destroyed. Dr. Moto rushed into the ship behind the task force, insisting to the operatives that the older version was the real SCP-173. This new monstrosity must be some sort of related anomaly that had somehow taken its place in containment. But as Moto argued, the MTF commander received an order in his earpiece. Lowering his weapon, the commander motioned for his men to do the same. Silently, solemnly, they turned their backs on the two sculptures. Wait, what are you doing? Moto yelled, panicking. You can't turn away! The second you'll stop watching, though! Everything went dark as a bag was slipped over Moto's head. The task force restrained him, their orders clear. They were to take Dr. Moto to the O5 Council, who would decide his fate. As Moto struggled in their grip, the deafening sound of concrete smashing against metal echoed through the ship's interior. Though he couldn't see it, Moto could imagine what was happening. The new SCP-173 was finishing what it had started. It was slamming the older sculpture against the walls, breaking apart its concrete shell piece by piece, until nothing remained but rebar and dust. When the noise finally stopped, Moto was dragged away by the task force. His vision was still obscured by the dark bag over his head. Their orders were clear. Take him to the O5 Council. They would decide what to do with him, after explaining what had truly happened to SCP-173. Now check out SCP-173 Origin Story, How 173 Got to Site-19, and SCP-173 The Complete Story for more.